Hi everybody, 10 years ago today, I uploaded the very first video to this YouTube channel. For 10 years, we've been providing a platform and a voice for homeless people to share their own stories and educate the public about homelessness from the experts. I mean, you don't get any more authentic than homeless people telling their own stories. Miracle after miracle have happened over these last 10 years. So many that I can't even list them all. And it's all made possible because of you. Being this our 10 year anniversary, I had plans to do a road trip this year. I wanted to launch the new Invisible People. The new Invisible People platform is, oh, so close to launching, but you know, life changes. As many of you know, I help take care of my mom. I'm at my mom's house right now, and a few weeks back, she had a heart attack. She's doing fine, but she's currently in a nursing home, and taking care of my mom really has been a priority. Uh, I'm, I'm grateful that I'm able to do that, but I just was not able to make this anniversary a big splash. That said, I had to say thank you to all of you for helping make history and helping tens of thousands of homeless people indirectly and directly over the last 10 years. I wanna tell you that Invisible People started because I wanted to change the world. But the truth really is I was just giving myself purpose to get up in the morning. It was a really scary time as I was facing homelessness a second time. My house was going into foreclosure and I didn't have any income. I mean, complete strangers back then paid my rent a few times. Otherwise, I would have been homeless myself. So I had this idea of interviewing homeless people and I almost didn't do it because, you know, video has to be edited. It has to have B-roll. It has to have graphics and music because I want to win an Emmy. The laptop I had wouldn't edit video. Now, at the time, I was Avid certified. That software they used to use way back when. A lot of people right here, Avid's coming back. But my workstation went away when I lost my house to foreclosure. So I had this dinky laptop and I couldn't edit video. And for a week, I actually sat and looked at the problem. I just went, oh gosh, I can't do this. I can't edit the video. I can't do this. I can't edit the video. And one day I went, you know what? I'm just gonna upload this stuff. I'm not gonna edit it. I can't edit it. I'm just gonna upload the videos. I'm just gonna upload the stories of homeless people raw, unedited, as is. And that was the magic. Authenticity has replaced production value. And the public, all of you, started watching these videos and you started sharing them and people started writing about it in their blogs. And it was truly, truly amazing. When I went and I started interviewing homeless people, it was very scary because I was crashing into homelessness myself. I would interview somebody and, I mean, I'd melt down. Um, I still am emotionally affected by many of the people I meet. But back then, <laughs> it was crushing because I was facing my own homelessness again for a second time. I would often not even be able to look at the footage because I was still holding on to that person's story as it related to my story as I was crashing back into homelessness. For whatever reason, I kept going. I really, I, I sometimes look back 
and try to think why? Why did I keep going? I mean, it didn't make any sense. Back then, there was a lot of pushback from the homeless sector. Now, Twitter and social media was brand spanking new back then. So here I am tweeting about homelessness. So you have the government and nonprofits who are working to end homelessness and they're doing a great job. They're doing the best they can with the resources that they have, but they don't want the public to see anything negative. And here I am tweeting that there's a homeless person here or there's a homeless person there and this person needs that and this person's out here dying and this person has been out here 20 years and there was huge pressure to stop me. The homeless sector doesn't necessarily want to even listen to homeless people. They don't. So my work of amplifying the voice of homeless people, raw and unedited, has not always been easily accepted. The homeless sector wants stories of formerly homeless people. I call them trophy stories. They only want success stories to be told. Now those stories are important because they validate that we can end homelessness. However, the stories of people still homeless are equally important because they build the empathy for the public to say, oh my gosh, we need to help these people. We need to do something. I believe if we just show success stories, the public detaches and they say, oh, we don't have to do anything. Look, they've ended homelessness. The other issue is when the public sees a success story or reads in the paper that we've ended homelessness or veterans homelessness, there's a huge issue because when the public is going down the street and they see the man with the cardboard sign begging for change and they're like, well, what is this? The homeless sector was just telling stories of people that they have helped. No one was sharing the stories of homeless people until I started doing this. Empowering a homeless person to share their own story can be so powerful, not just to the viewer, but also the homeless person. Imagine that you have been ignored time and time and day after day and people just keep walking by you and here somebody comes and says, what's your story? I believe the most important thing we can give other people is our positive intention. One of my first big breaks was I was sick of eating dollar pizzas. I, at Ralph's Grocery Store, there was these dollar pizzas that I used to buy. They're pretty much cardboard. Um, and I was just so sick of them. I saw on Twitter that the social media club was having an event on the 21st floor of the Universal Sheraton. And the admission was $10 and there was food. I figured that being the Universal Sheraton that the food would be really good. So I went to my first social media event just for the food. The social media event was on branding and they had this panel and this guy says, if I was Motrin, I would have never given the Motrin moms any attention because they don't have any power. All of a sudden, this woman stands up and she says, I'm Jessica Cotley. I am the Motrin mom. If you Google Motrin, my name comes up before theirs. Don't say, I don't have any power. <laughs> it was really awesome. Then I tweet out, I go to a social media event and a hockey game breaks out. And that got retweeted and 
I became friends with Jessica Gottlieb, who has been instrumental in helping invisible people over the years. And Babette, who's the founder of Bake Space, was on our board for a while. She was on the panel. And that one event really was a catalyst into not only helping invisible people grow, but it showed me that maybe there was something here. I was unemployed for a very long time. I was trying to get a job in the homeless sector, but I don't have an MSW and homeless services has become professionalized and even though I was homeless, they don't really consider that as a asset. Now it changed a little bit. These days they're hiring peer workers, but back then, if you were a homeless person, it was rare that you would get a job in homeless services unless maybe you worked your way up through a shelter that you originally stayed at and then they brought you on as staff. It was extremely hard for me to get a job. And this woman, Laviva Prim, took a chance on me and hired me for a three month temp job at the winter shelter. That job changed my life. It was the first time I was really connected to homeless services. I mean, I've been working with homeless people through faith-based and ministry, but it's completely different. The first winter shelter was the best because they had to bus people from Glendale every night to the Burbank Armory. So my job was just to man this tent outside where homeless people would gather and wait for the bus. Now, I could go on and on about how wonderful it was and how many challenges there was, but I learned a lot about homelessness. One of my first Invisible People campaigns, I wanted to really make Los Angeles yellow by providing rain ponchos to all the homeless people. So I did a fundraiser and we did. We, we gave thousands of rain ponchos to homeless people throughout Los Angeles. Glendale Winter Shelter changed my life. It, there were no benefits and it didn't even cover rent, but I learned about homelessness and I met so many people. Natalie, who was the CEO, executive director at the time, uh, she really taught me a lot about homelessness. Um, and I'm sure I drove her crazy. Social media was really brand new back then. In fact, I think Andy Bale, CEO of Union Rescue Mission, and me were the only ones really twittering about homelessness at the time. The Glendale Winter Shelter slept about 150 people every night. Now, I was using social media in a way that I wanted people to relate to something that they would take for granted. So I was sharing about my experience working at the shelter, and I was doing it in a way that was respectful, but also was very anonymous. No names were being shared. But it was brand new. I mean, nobody was doing anything like this. So one night I tweet out, we ran out of pillows. And Andy sees this. Now, Andy at the time, Union Rescue Mission was in charge of the LASA contract. So Andy sees me tweeting this and he gets in touch with his staff and he's like raising holy hell that we ran out of pillows. And then it would get back to Natalie and Laviva and then we would all have to go down to Union Rescue Mission for these meetings. And it was like really, really crazy. I give Natalie huge credit for putting up with me and, and really riding the wave to see where this social media thing is gonna go. 
and how it can actually help people and help the cause in fighting homelessness. And huge props to Andy Bales for listening and caring and taking action to help people. There's so many great winter shelter stories. One year, Invisible People, thanks to all of you, catered a Christmas meal. Everybody got a, a gift bag. And then Shannon did this thing with Richard Branson where he sent his shoe and it just kind of went crazy. Being that it's the holiday season, this memory from the winter shelter, I just have to share. I was transporting a mom and her son. They had lost everything. I mean, they had no clothes, nothing. I was sharing it on social media, hoping to raise a little support to help them. Well, Pastor Matthew Barnett saw my tweets. He contacted me, said, take them to Walmart. I'll buy everything, but get the kid some portable video games, mobile video games. So we hid them at the counter, and then when the kid was coming through, and I live streamed it all. I mean, this is 2008, 2009. Nowadays, we take live streaming for granted. Do you have that gift over there? Yep. Yeah. This is part of it. Who's that go for? That is probably the coolest present you can oh, ever get. That is, that is for you, my man. That's a Nintendo DS portable video game system. Los Angeles was having monsoon rains, and the winter shelter kicks people outside during the daytime. Homeless people, and seniors, disabled, didn't matter. They're being thrown out in this torrential rain. Being that the shelters are at the National Guard Armory, only the governor, who was Arnold Schwarzenegger at the time, can open them up during the daytime. So, didn't know what to do. I took a camera and stood out in front of the winter shelter in the rain and recorded this video that eventually went all the way to the governor and he opened up the winter shelters. Again, this morning, yesterday morning, and tomorrow morning, 600 people were thrown outside into this rain. And that's not just, that's just not acceptable. I would really, really love the people that make those decisions to respond to this post, to respond to this video, and let us all know why they kicked 600 people out into the rain yesterday morning, this morning, and tomorrow morning. When the winter shelter closed, I was laid off and I started to look for work again. The, the recession was in full force. Uh, it was a really dark time. I was applying, applying for work and there was no work to be found. I turned on the TV and at the time, Oprah had gone into the tent cities in Sacramento. It created a media storm. So you had CNN and MSNBC and all the, everybody, you know, Oprah goes into the tent city, everybody goes in. Well, it was a real slap in the face to the mayor in Sacramento and they started, you know, moving people. And I'm watching this on TV and I'm saying nobody's sharing their story. Nobody's sharing the story of homeless people. I mean, they're sharing the story of them being moved, but nobody's really interviewing homeless people to get their side of what's going on. So I'm sitting on my couch. I have $300, rent's due. The smart person would have continued to look for work, but I've never been the smartest person. I took that money and I drove up to Sacramento and I went out into the field. Now it was really scary because anyone with a camera was now the enemy. And here I go off into the fields with a camera I remember not thinking that I was going to even come back. I was so far out in the woods and it really was dangerous. 
but the people I was meeting, and it was like out of Africa or something. I mean, it really, really moved me. And Scott Harrison from Charity Water, he messages me and says, hey dude, whatever you're doing, keep do going, how do I donate? It's, this is Scott Harrison. And that moment, I realized that if I keep doing this, I'm gonna survive. So it was pretty simple math. Keep traveling, keep sharing stories of homeless people, and you're not gonna end up on the streets again. So I kept going. I've always experimented with trying to bring you all along with me. I'm doing that now with vlogs. I'm hoping to expand that to more produced web series. But back then, all I had was an app called Whirl. I don't know if you remember Whirl, but it was kind of a, it was a photo storytelling app, but also had this geolocation component to it. While I'm out in the fields of Sacramento, I'm using Whirl to tell the story of me going out. You know, Invisible People shares the story of homeless people, and I was using Whirl to share the story of me. Their marketing person, Heather Meeker, sees it. They never thought about nonprofits using their app at the time. They were blown away. Heather contacts me and says, we would like to fly you to Seattle to speak to our developers. We're also going to have an event we'd like you to speak and we're going to invite local nonprofits and Chris Perillo is going to be there. Now I didn't know who Chris Perillo is. Here I am unemployed, no income. I probably had 200 Twitter followers back then. I hadn't yet formulated a plan for invisible people at that time. I was just moving forward and that forward momentum was catching the attention of Whirl in Seattle. I flew to Seattle and remember they had a tweet up. That's what it was, a tweet up, remember those? Now this is right when the iPhone first came out with video, with being able to record video. And Chris Perillo comes up to me and he says, you need a phone with video capabilities. I'm gonna buy you a new iPhone. And he did. Oh my gosh, it was amazing. And why I, I tell that story is because it really shows how invisible people, even at the early days, started having influence with the general population. I'm really grateful how Invisible People has reached so many homeless service providers. I'm grateful that many of them have changed their communication strategies because of my work, but I'm focused on the public, the people that are not connected to social work. So the story of Whirl really demonstrates how even at our beginning, we were influencing influencers. One of the reasons here at our 10 year anniversary to talk about the world story is to show how the universe just comes together and creates magic when you're doing good. From the Sacramento trip, World flies me in, I meet Chris Perillo, and then Chris Perillo not only gets me an iPhone with video capabilities, he invites me to speak at his conference, Gnome Dex. Now, I couldn't find a job, so I kept traveling, and I actually started traveling around the U.S. doing a road trip. 
I parked in North Carolina and flew up to Seattle to speak at Gnomedex. This is my first major speaking gig. I was so nervous, but I, I had this idea of inviting a homeless person to take the stage. During my first visit to Seattle with the tech startup Whirl, the executives went with me to Nicholsville, a tent city. That's a miracle in itself. We met James, who I interviewed and put on Invisible People. So as I was preparing to speak at Gnomedex, I got this idea, what if I invite James to speak? Back then, I don't know if you remember, Twitter had outages all the time. The fail whale was coming up all the time. And this was kind of risky. I pre-wrote a tweet on my phone with a link to James's story. Then after James's story that I played live in my presentation, I called James up from the audience to the stage to answer people's questions. And I pulled out my phone and I said, here, you know, share this. And it was the tweet that went around the world. Literally, CNN documented the word homeless trended on Twitter. Back then, Michael Jackson trends on Twitter. Steve Jobs trends on Twitter. Not homeless. Even better, while we were doing the Q&A, somebody passed a hat and $1,800 was raised that went to Nicholsville that they used for porta potties. As if that's not enough, Chris Perillo and team sent, oh my gosh, so much food, they had a feast. As I look back, Gnomedex was the one event, and there's been many events that have helped invisible people, but Gnomedex really was that pinnacle moment in time that just changed everything for the better. Gnomedex, through relationships, really made all the difference. It's where I met Chris Brogan. He gave me his shoes in the lobby. He'll tell you that somebody gave him the shoes and he was just trying to pass them on. Liz Strauss, uh, just so many people. Jeff Pulver. Jeff Pulver allowed me to bring homeless people on stage at his Twitter conferences. I mean, Homeless Services doesn't even allow homeless people on the stage at their conferences. Here, people experiencing homelessness are taking the stage, speaking about homelessness to the general public. Over the last 10 years, there's been countless, countless, countless miracles. Little ones from just helping homeless people with socks and food and hats and gloves and wheelchairs and walkers and beds and furnishing apartments to flying whole families across the country so that they, they could get back to their family. There's been people literally housed because of their Invisible People videos. Then the big ones like the city of Los Angeles and the county of Los Angeles bringing invisible people in to help with Prop HHH and Measure H. And seven of the top 10 posts shared for Prop HHH came from invisible people, far above the LA Times. There was a lot of moving parts to that campaign. There was door knocking and postcards and events. Invisible people only played a small part, but we helped the digital campaign. We were the digital campaign for Prop HHH and Measure H. We brought it home online and hopefully helping 45,000 homeless people over the next 10 years. Invisible people's focus is to reach the general public, educating people who don't normally connect with the social services sector about homelessness. We reach more people doing just that than all other homeless services combined. Many of them have multi-million dollar marketing budgets. We can't even afford to hire one person. 
but I keep going. Why? Because the work is important. We're seeing time and again where communities want to do something to move the needle to help homeless people and the public is fighting against it. You can have all the money in the world, but if you don't have public support, we're never going to end homelessness. I have data that shows over the last five years, we've generated over 4 billion impressions on social media. 4 billion impressions. An impression is when a piece of content is shown, like on a phone or a desktop. We can't prove that you're actually looking at it, but 4 billion impressions is huge. And that's not counting the millions of people that saw Dateline. I'll put a link down below. The Ricky Lake Show, I'll put a link to that down below. Uh, CNN three times, MTV, PBS. I could go on and on. But what's really been amazing this last year is all of you. We've exploded. Thanks to you, I made a mistake when I first started because I'd never thought there would be a community around homelessness. And there is. You guys are awesome. 200,000 subs. 200,000 subs. To put that in perspective, a nonprofit may have a thousand subs, a homeless nonprofit, a few hundred. We have 200,000 subs. We just hit 39 million views. Now, if you go over 10 years, that's not a real lot, but 25 million of those views happened in the last 365 days. That means our benchmark now, our yearly minimum benchmark is 25 million views. And it's all thanks to you. No one even comes close to what Invisible People has been able to accomplish educating millions upon millions upon millions of people about homelessness. No one. We have made history and we're going to continue to make history. We have a brand new Invisible People. I was hoping to launch it today, but with taking care of my mom, I wasn't able to make it happen. It's close to finish. It will be up soon. It will be a place for young adults to learn about homelessness. Right now, kids have to go and download a 46-page academic PDF to do their homework assignments. The new Invisible People will have content that makes it real easy for young adults or anyone to learn about homelessness. 2019 will be the 10 year anniversary of the first Invisible People road trip. Next year, we're gonna hit the road and we're gonna visit as many of you as possible, traveling from city to city, highlighting the stories of people experiencing homelessness and those of you working to end homelessness. The last 10 years, I've basically done this work in my spare time while I work other jobs for my own support. Now, going forward, invisible people needs to hire staff. We need to be able to reach our potential and multiply impact. The need to gain public support in ending homelessness is going to increase. Invisible people has a built-in network to reach people. Once we get enough funding to hire staff and target our messaging, we are going to have significant increase in impact. If you'd like to help us, please join us on Patreon. Monthly support means so much. If you'd like to give a one-time gift, there's a link below. Thank you so much for supporting Invisible People the last 10 years. I believe together we're just starting. Thank you.